Well, we have, uh, yes, please go ahead. We'll just keep moving and I have a cushion now and God knows what will happen. <laughs> well, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Simpson, Chairman Bowles, and members of the commission. I'm Judith Palfrey. I'm the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and I really appreciate the opportunity to testify. As you compile your recommendations, the AAP urges this commission to do no harm regarding our nation's children, but rather to assure their success. Of the world's richest 21 nations, the United States comes in last in terms of overall health and safety of our children. For instance, babies born in the United States today are less likely to survive until their first birthday than those in 27 other industrialized <clears throat> nations. And one in 11 high school students reports attempting suicide. Now, how can this be? The fact is that the United States spends less, of our, it spends less on our children's health, education, and general welfare than most other developed nations in the world. Children are 31% of the U.S. population, but the health care services for children account for only 12% of total annual health care payments. In January, the Urban Institute and Brookings report that less than one-tenth of the federal budget, less than one-tenth of the federal budget was spent on children. Along with the Children's Health Insurance Program, the Medicaid program provides the bulk of publicly funded health-related services for children. While more than half of the enrollees in this critical medical Medicaid safety net are children, their cost in 2004 was only a quarter of the whole. Recent budgetary actions in Washington make the American Academy of Pediatrics very concerned. Efforts underway in the FFY 2011 budget process will have negative impact on such vital and successful public health programs as Section 317 immunizations, newborn screening, prematurity prevention, and school health. The AAP urges the Commission not to embrace this trend that handicaps the efforts to invest in children. But the good news is there are many ways that we can reduce costs and at the same time have a healthier nation. We can reduce prematurity and low birth weights. Preterm births cost us $26 billion every year in health care, educational costs, and opportunity costs. But proper investment in prenatal care can reduce these costs by preventing prematurity in the first place. With each $1 invested in prenatal interventions, we can save two to three in hospital and long-term costs. We can reduce vaccine-preventable illnesses, making immunizations more available and identifying new vaccine therapies through research investments. The economic impact of immunization schedule provides net savings of nearly $10 billion in direct costs and $43 billion in societal costs. And we can and we must reduce the increasing weight of our children and the weight of the long-term health consequences of obesity, which directly impacts the cost of health care. The Milken Institute estimates that over $200 billion are there in avoidable costs for the care of adults with hypertension, diabetes, and heart disease if we reduce childhood obesity to 1998 levels by 2023. By focusing on the needs of our children, we ensure the United States can compete in the global marketplace. Other nations currently outperform U.S. in terms of economic competitiveness. Investments must be made in our children to improve graduation rates, prioritizing parenting and health education, and devote researches to early brain and child development. These will yield high returns for the American economy. As you work to save and restructure federal programs for America's aging populations, please consider how your actions are directly to tied to your youngest. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Matz. I'm the Director of Public Policy and Government Relations for the American Association of University Women. Co-Chairman Simpson, Co-Chairman Bowles, I'm pleased to be before you today to provide this testimony on behalf of AUW. Since 1881, we have been the nation's leading voice promoting education and equity for women and girls. Today, we are a nationwide network of more than 100,000 members and donors, 1,000 branches, and 500 college and university partners. Like many Americans, AUW members have grown increasingly concerned about our national debt. We also recognize the need to get a firm handle on our growing deficits as well. 
Tough choices are ahead of us, choices that will test the values of our nation. I come to you not necessarily as a budget wonk, but as a representative of community-based women doing grassroots work, women who are doing work across the country that hope as you do undertake this important work of the commission, that you'll remember the realities of their lives as you go about making your decisions. AUW's member adopted public policy program states that we support public policies that balance individual rights and responsibility to the community. Clearly, this is a problem that must be addressed because today that balance is precarious. But it must be addressed within the context of a recession and continued high unemployment. I don't envy you this difficult task that is before you. AUW is pleased that the commission is hearing from a wide variety of policy and fiscal ex experts and for our part would like to offer the following guidepost as you go about challenge your challenging task. It is similar, in fact, to the person sitting next to me, and that is the notion of doing no harm to the most vulnerable among us, the people most likely to depend on these entitlement programs. Women's economic security, especially women-headed household, have, uh, has always been uncertain. Nearly half a century after passage of the Equal Pay Act, women earn on average about 77 cents for every dollar that men earn. Minority women face an even bigger gap. This disparity is especially harmful given that women today make up half of the paid labor force in the United States, and two-thirds of all women are either the primary or co-breadwinners of their families. Never before has a woman, have a woman's wages been so important to her family's economic security. We urge you to keep in mind the real-world, long-term consequences of this pernicious wage gap. It makes women much more likely to be poor and results in them being much more likely to need assistance across their lifespan. AUW believes in, in maintaining the principles of this country's critical social safety net. The progressive nature of social security, for example, is in fact, uh, is critical. In fact, more than half of older women would fall into poverty without these benefits. And further estimates show that the poverty rate for individuals aged 65 and older would increase from 10% to nearly 50% without social security. Medicare and Medicaid also very much have a woman's face. In 2007, Medicare covered more than 26 million women, comprising more than 60% of all program beneficiaries. They also tend to use more of its services and were more than 60% of enrollees in the prescription drug program. And when it comes to Medicaid, 70% of the program's total adult beneficiaries were women. In fact, more than one in 10 American women depend on this program for their health care. While we understand the dire need to achieve cost savings and particularly eliminating wasteful and fraudulent spending, we're very pleased that health care reform has gotten a portion of that with savings through medical records IT, uh, working on fraudulent spending, and also better preventative care. However, the other thing that remains is that we must do no harm. We understand the gravity of the task before you. We simply ask that you always remember that those who need the most help can least afford to shoulder the burden of balancing our budgets. Thank you. Chairman Bowles, Chairman Simpson, uh, members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, my name is Edward Coyle, and I'm the Executive Director of the Alliance for Retired Americans, a four million member national organization uh, with grassroots chapters in 30 states. Uh, I'd like to spend my time in front of you today talking about Social Security. Retirees are deeply disturbed by talk coming out of the commission and in the press about cutting Social Security benefits and raising the retirement age. The truth is, Social Security is one of America's great success stories. It has kept generations of seniors out of poverty. It did not, and I repeat, did not, cause these deficits. The fact of the matter is that Social Security currently has a surplus of $2.6 trillion. Social Security is a fiscally conservative, self-sufficient program with a dedicated source of revenue. Of revenue. It is an efficient, solid program with only 1% of funds going to, over, to administrative costs. I respectfully challenge the Commission to find a federal government pr program that runs as efficiently and as effectively as Social Security, and one that is financially solvent, by the way, well into the future. No one dislikes the federal debt more than today's retirees. They don't want it to be the legacy they leave behind to their children and to their grandchildren. And they ask the question, is our federal budget deficit too large? Yes, it is. They also say, is it Social Security's fault? And the answer is no. I know you've just heard from America Speaks, and frankly, in America Speaks reports, a lot of our members participated in their program over the weekend, and we find a lot that we can agree with uh, in what the America Speaks program has uh, suggested. 
but retirees are greatly disturbed uh, that they are recommending increasing the retirement age to age 69. Not only would this reduce benefits, which as I said, have nothing to do with the budget deficit, but it would also be devastating to American workers, particularly those workers who work in physically demanding uh, construction and service sector jobs. Americans in their late 50s and in their early 60s are already bearing the brunt of layoffs and benefit cuts from the recession. Raising the retirement age would inflict further hardship among a group of workers who are struggling to keep their job, let alone find another one. Many people face increasing health prob problems in these years. Simply put, many workers cannot continue in their jobs until they are almost 70 years old. The Alliance for Retired Americans strongly rejects the gloom and doom, sky is falling predictions that Social Security is going bankrupt. Not only is this factually untrue, it is a scare tactic, in my view, to divert attention away from the root causes of the deficit, unwise tax and spending decisions by Washington over the past decade. To further strengthen Social Security's financial structure, the Alliance for Retired Americans supports raising the payroll tax cap currently at $106,800 for the wealthiest Americans. Right now, someone like Bill Gates is paying the same Social Security taxes as a worker who's making $106,000 a year. Experts have said that raising the cap to 90% of all wages would fill one-third of a projected shortfall over the next 75 years in the Social Security Trust Fund. This change would only increase taxes on 6% of all workers, but would further strengthen Social Security benefits for the remaining 94% of workers when they retire. We all know that retirees care a lot about other than uh, about themselves. They worry about their children and their grandchildren in these difficult times. Will they ever be able to retire? And if so, what will be there for them? At a time of rising cynicism toward government, particularly among young people, it is more important than ever that our nation fully honor the promise of Social Security. Thank you all very much. We'll move on now to the next uh, panel. Uh, and if you'll introduce yourselves as you come forward. Uh. Sure. Please go ahead and give your name and, re and your organization, and uh, thank you for being here. Should I? <laughs> I'll start on this side. Sure. I, I'm uh, David Beckman. I'm the president of Bread for the World. Bread for the World is a collective Christian voice urging our nation's leaders to end hunger at home and abroad. <clears throat> and I want to make uh, three points. First, I want to talk about God and people in need. I'm pretty sure of my facts on that. Then I want to talk a little bit about macroeconomic policy. And finally, uh, about some specific ways that we could make our government more efficient in its spending. Uh, the needs of hungry people or other people who have severe troubles are sacred. When Jesus said, how is God going to judge the nations? Uh, he said that the judge will focus on what did we do for hungry people, for prisoners, for other people in need. And no matter what you believe about God, it is clear that to be a good, good person or a good nation, you've got to protect people in need. So with some confidence, I ask you in the name of God, as you're doing your work, to frame recommendations that will protect people in need. Now, the Bible doesn't say much about macroeconomic policy. Um, but we do know that for hungry and poor people, jobs are super important. And uh, the persistence of high unemployment does argue for continued stimulus spending in order to bring in unemployment down. And if we can get a full employment economy, we'll also increase tax revenue, and that'll help to reduce the deficit. I think our country is also going to have to reduce tax rates on high-income people. Despite all the loud complaints about taxes, the uh, total tax burden on Americans is lower now than it has been since the 1950s. When it comes to spending, I'm really persuaded by the Center on Budget and Policy Priority uh, analysis that shows that our government's spending a fifth of its 
uh, money in, in each of three areas, defense, social security, and health care, mainly Medicare. So if we're going to be serious about cutting spending, we have to cut defense, social security for high-income people in some way, Medicare for high-income people. And then they, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities says that all of the programs of assistance for people facing hardship, hardship of any kind, all those programs together, except Medicaid, amount to 14% of our spending. So in my mind, we should make those programs efficient, we should demand results, but we shouldn't cut those programs. Now, Bread for the World focuses a lot of our attention on foreign aid and on food and farm policy. And we see clear opportunities to spend money more efficiently in those two areas. Now, Bread for the World is part of a broad coalition of groups that care about global poverty, that are trying to get reform of foreign assistance, uh, getting more of our aid dollars who, to people who really need help, and using that whole package of money in more efficient ways, better coordination, more responsive to local people. The president and uh, both the, the administration and both uh, the authorizing committees in both houses of Congress are moving toward a rewrite of the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961. That would give us a big opportunity to uh, make better use of foreign aid dollars. I think it's very clear that our foreign policies are distorted by special interests. The Environmental Working Group estimates that um, the federal government has spent a trillion, one trillion dollars on farm subsidies since 1995, and three quarters of that money has gone to the top 10 percent of farms. At the same time, the Department of Agriculture tells us that one quarter of the kids in our country now live in households that run out of food. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairman Bowles and Chairman Simpson, members of the Commission. I'm Robert Birdall, President of American Universities, an organization of leading public and private universities. On behalf of the 61 U.S. members of AAU, I want to thank you for this opportunity and for taking on this difficult task. AAU's mission is to advance basic research and higher education, particularly graduate education. These are two critical areas of investment for America's future, as they produce the ideas and the people essential to innovation, the foundation of economic growth, improved health, and strengthen national and homeland security. At AAU, we have never considered it our place to address the nation's broader fiscal policies. We have not encouraged Congress to reduce deficits or to ignore them, to pay down the debt or not, to tax more or less. But we believe we can no longer stand on the sidelines. We believe that now is the time to address our nation's looming fiscal challenges. We share the concern of most Americans and most economists that our country cannot sustain its current fiscal trajectory and that failure to reduce deficits and manage our national debt could have a crushing effect on the nation's future. I want to focus on one of the dangers of our rapidly rising debt, the threat to our nation's ability to invest in its future. A nation that does not invest in its future by educating and training its people, by conducting the research that leads to discovery and progress, by investing in infrastructure, by protecting the environment, a nation that doesn't do these things does not have a bright future, or at least not one worthy of a great nation. Most of the investment portion of the federal budget is found in discretionary spending, as demonstrated in the federal investment chapter of the analytical perspective section of the President's budget. Large budget deficits, particularly going forward, are not a result of an extraordinary increase in domestic discretionary spending, and certainly not in the nation's investment spending. Nor is a genuine solution to be found there. If we agree that maintaining our ability to invest in our future is a reason for deficit reduction, it makes little sense 
to target vital investments for spending cuts. Clearly, government should eliminate waste and nonproductive programs. However, to achieve serious deficit reduction, we believe there are no alternatives other than to slow the rise of mandatory spending programs and to increase federal tax revenues through economic growth and increased taxes. As a nation, we have to muster the political will to make the tough choices. I assure you that our universities are making difficult choices as they deal with sharply reduced revenues. Allow me to focus on the nation's investments in higher education and research. For most of the federal investment in higher education is in financial aid for students through Pell Grants for low-income students or other financial aid programs. And there is a national consensus, I believe, on the need to invest in our nation's students. Likewise, the benefits of a strong federal investment in basic research have been understood by national leaders across the political spectrum since World War II. Numerous studies have found that, the, that up to half of the U.S. economic growth in the latter half of the 20th century stemmed from new technologies and the advances in science and engineering that enabled them. The private sector has ceased to invest in basic research. The great industrial research laboratories like Bell Laboratories are all but gone. Today, the federal government is the primary investor in basic research, and universities and government laboratories are the places where most basic research is conducted. This unique government-university partnership has made us the global leader in research and discovery by combining research with the advanced training of young scientists and engineers, a system now being adopted zealously by international competitors like China. Addressing the big challenges facing our nation and the world, health, energy, the environment, national and homeland security, food security, these challenges require basic research and talented, highly educated people. The investment we make in people and in discovery must be sustained. If we do not control budget deficits, that will be increasingly difficult. Thank you again for this opportunity. The nation's research universities deeply appreciate your efforts and your daunting challenge to be both bold and wise. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, Grover. Thank you. Uh, my name is Grover Norquist. I run Americans for Tax Reform. We receive no federal funding. I will try not to confuse God and Caesar. Uh, the problem you face is a spending problem. The uh, government spends too much money, federal, state, and local. The problem isn't that they don't take enough, it's that they spend too much. Federal spending has been at about 18% since the 1970s. The next decade, spending is scheduled to go about 23% uh, using rosy scenarios. So, we're spending too much, not taxing too little. Uh, in fact, if you look at the cost of government, the regulatory burden plus the spending burden, Americans in 2006, before Congress changed into Democratic hands, Americans worked until July 10th to pay the total cost of spending and regulations. Now, three plus years later, that's August 11th. The American people have lost a month to the bailouts, the spending, the new spending programs, and the regulatory excesses. One more month is the cost to government. It can be turned around. It was, in fact, when Reagan cut taxes uh, from 82 to 88 during the period of Reagan's economic policies. We gained two weeks. We went from July 20th to July 2nd in terms of the cost to government, spending plus taxes. So uh, one of the things to keep in mind is focus on the problem, which is total government spending. Trying to chase government spending with tax increases was tried in 1982. Um, with the promise of $1 of tax hikes, which happened, and $3 of spending cuts, which didn't happen. Spending increased faster than before and under inflation. 1990, the same uh, game was played. We were promised $2 in spending restraint for every dollar in tax hikes, real tax hikes, no spending restraint. Tax hikes are what politicians do when they don't have the determination or the competence to govern. Uh, we've seen other countries try to raise taxes to reduce the deficit, Greece, Portugal, Italy, Venezuela, Argentina, Zimbabwe, Japan during the lost decade, and California under both Republicans and Democrats, New York State and New Jersey, although New Jersey has just decided on a different path in the last day. 
There is a way to get more revenue, and that's to have more economic growth. CBO says if you can simply get the growth to go up by 1% a year, uh, up 1% over a decade, that's $2.5 trillion in additional revenue through growth, not through higher taxes. That ought to be what we're focused on in terms of revenue. Uh, however, there's certainly a lot of ways to reduce spending. I would suggest bringing back what used to be called the Byrd Committee, set up in World War II. It was a committee to reduce unnecessary federal expenditures. It actually existed. It saved $38 billion in today's dollars by ending programs like the WPA and the CCC, which were make work projects. Uh, and that's been something that could be brought back into existence. If we had a law that required that every law, any law put forward before the American people that cost money uh, would simply be online for five days, then people could read it. The so-called stimulus package, the $800 billion, which has led to the recent decline in unemployment in America, would never have passed if the American people could have read it online for five days. The health care legislation, one, two, or three trillion dollars in new spending, would never have passed in the form that it did if the American people could have read it before it went on. The cap and tax proposal would never have passed the House if the American people could have read it. So one of the important ways to stop overspending is to make sure the American people can read legislation, and if it's amended in the middle of the night, as each of these bills were, with people writing stuff in with their hands and putting goodies in for their friends, then, it, then the five days has to start again, and any American can read the bill online before Congress votes on it. Uh, I would suggest that the, the uh, federal government do what some states have done, like Texas. Every contract the state of Texas enters into is online. That's not the case for contracts and labor contracts at the federal level. Uh, it, every check written by the state of Texas is online. You can look at it. That ought to be the case at the federal government. A lot of states are following that path more ought to do so. Uh, I would recommend that appropriators who think of themselves as spenders for their entirety of time in Congress should be limited to six years on the Appropriations Committee. That's what we did with the Budget Committee. In order to make sure there wasn't too much power in the Budget Committee, you could only be there for six years. That would change the situation where people could come to Congress, be appropriators sometimes, not appropriators other times, and hopefully if we could form the Byrd Committee, they could actually join the Unappropriators Committee. Last thought in, in terms of making the economy better, Congress should go home more often. Uh, if you look at the stock market uh, from 1965 to 2009, when Congress is not in session, the stock market goes up 16% on an annualized basis. When Congress is in session, it goes up on a 1% annualized basis. So the more Congress stays home, the less they threaten the economy with new taxes and regulations, the faster the economy grows. This would be an important step forward and doesn't cost any money. Uh, and lastly, um, I would recommend that this commission's ideas be brought before the American people 30 days before the next election so that congressmen and senators and candidates for those offices can speak to the suggestions that you've put forward and the American people can vote based on whether or not they support a value-added tax or additional taxes or not. That may do tremendous things both for economic growth and to keep the tax rates down by changing the nature of who serves in the body. Thank you. Well, Grover, uh, it's good to see you face to face because we seem to blast away on each other remotely. So I'm going to have a little time just right now to ask you some questions. First of all, we, sure. we know no one who has ever said to us as a commission that we could grow our way out of this. They have told us, everyone has told us, that we could have double-digit growth mm -hmm. for 30 years and never get out of this hole. Are you aware of those statistics? Well, two things. I'm not suggesting that you don't rein in spending. I'm not suggesting that the only uh, uh, way to fix things is economic growth. But economic growth is an important part of reducing the size of government as a percentage of the economy. That, the goal is to reduce the cost of government as a percentage of what of people's lives. And uh, you want both economic growth and reduced spending. I went through a series of rather specific fixes. Um, for instance, if you had legislation online for five days, a lot of the nonsense, a lot of the corruption that gets stuck in at the last moment wouldn't happen. So you, could, you could sit down and hunt them all down and make a list of the, of the silly programs that have been shipped to West Virginia over the last 30 years. Or you could simply say, how about changing the rules so this doesn't happen in the future? And I think that allowing the American people having 300 million sets of eyes 
on the kind of spending and taxes that Congress uh, tries to engage in would stop some of the most egregious and wasteful spending. I, I just asked you, are you aware of the statistic that is shared with us that I just gave you? You're aware that there's no way to do this growth, double-digit growth won't get us there? You know that. Okay. I think you're making another presumption. I, no, you have I'm not no making spending a presumption. I, those well, are not facts that have given to us by every single person in the game. But if, if you don't want to go any further with it, let me ask you another question. But I think there's the presumption yeah. there that you're saying if you make no changes in spending, growth alone won't do it. Is that the study I'm you're saying that, that growth, economic growth, Absent double spending restraint for 30 years will not get us out of this hole. That's a pretty good statement. I'm not going to go any further. That's what we know. That's what we're told by every group. Okay. Absent spending restraint, that may well be true. I don't know which study they're referring to. I'd love to see it. Well, there's um, a bill in by Paul Ryan which has to do with spending restraint only and no taxes and no, no Republican or anybody else has joined with the poor guy to help. Uh, he's, I think, a remarkable member of this commission and no one has jumped aboard. But oh, let's hop around a little and you get yeah. your licks. You, if we came out with this proposal 30 days before the election, it would be the greatest cherry picking exercise the world has ever known and every single person running for office would say, do you know what they're doing in there? Let me tell you. And they would just simply pick from 90 different things we're looking at. We won't get resolved till after the election. That is a cherry picker politicians. It's, it's fairy tale land. So we're coming up with December 1st. That's our order. We, we are charged with that. Yeah, so that was the that design. I understand that. Good. And the final one, and you mentioned him and I didn't, Ronald Reagan. Hmm? Ronald Reagan raised taxes 11 times in his administration. I was here. Hmm? I was here. I knew him better than anybody in this room. The big four were the 1982 Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act, which he described as the biggest mistake of his administration. What I were bet. the other three? Well, yes, but I'm describing it as what Ronald Reagan did. Right. So then you can comment he regretted. on what you assess it. The second no, one was the gas tax. Right. Just let me finish, and then sure. you can raise hell. The gas tax increase of 82, the Greenspan Commission in 83, 84, the Deficit Reduction Act, and those were the big ones, and then you got into the Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 85, the one of the 85, the one of 86, the Continuing Resolution of 87, the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 87, which was 8.6 billion bucks of a tax increase, came to total cumulative tax increases under Ronald Reagan of 132.7 billion bucks. Mm -hmm. Now, what are your, what's your thought about your idol in that kind of trash? Well, I think, as you know, Ronald Reagan came into office and his first act was to call for a 30 percent, 33 percent across the board cut uh, in marginal tax rates, which he largely uh, accomplished through a hostile Congress, an uncomprehending Senate, and a hostile House. Um, and the good news is that uh, that brought us economic growth throughout the decade. Uh, were the, did, did he end up signing tax increase? As I said, at 82, there was a rather significant tax increase, which he uh, thinks was the biggest mistake of his presidency. I think he's probably right on that, and that the tax increases were unfortunate compromises uh, with a Congress that was hostile to where he was trying to go. But in general, his policies, I mean, I have written testimony, which we don't have time to go through, but I have a list of things that could be done to have more economic growth, which g would give you more resources, starting with free trade. One of the things Reagan fought for, and unfortunately this administration has declared war on the free trade agenda. That hurts our economy, the world economy, uh, and is unfortunate that special interests have that kind of power in this town at this time, to stop free trade agreements that have already been agreed to with the Koreans and the Colombians and the Panamanians. This is very, very sad uh, and destructive, but that kind of damage to economic growth hurts at, on the revenue side as well. Well, I, I've been around Washington and power. Like it's pretty powerful when you go to legislators and say, if you don't sign this no tax pledge for the rest of your days, your history. Well, what, you, the pledge that Americans for tax uh, shares with uh, candidates tax, is, any tax is a history. commitment. 
uh, that they will not increase uh, taxes, mm -hmm. and about 1,100 state legislators have taken it as well, mm -hmm. many of the governors. And I think the good news is that we have models for governors, the Virginia governor, uh, Governor Christie of, of uh, New Jersey, with a hostile legislature, not a legislature of his own making. Uh, he just wrestled uh, somewhere but either a 4 and 8 percent reduction in spending, if you count uh, the federal uh, stimulus spending from the last two years, and it's an 8% cut. If you take that out and just look at state spending, uh, it's a 4% reduction. And the unions have spent millions of dollars to try and trash him politically, and he stood tough on that without raising taxes. So I, I think that we have models at the state level, and we have models um, uh, throughout history that we can look to. Spending restraint and pro-growth policies are the way to reduce the cost of government. Well, my question, re rephrased, was mm -hmm. when you go to legislators and say, sign this anti-tax thing or mm -hmm. your history, what is your response to that? Well, we offer it to all candidates, Republicans and Democrats, and there's some people who say, I wouldn't want to sign this because I'm elected by special interests that want higher taxes. So they refuse to sign and say, I'm going to raise taxes. There are other elected officials who think that they represent taxpayers, and they cheerfully sign the pledge and keep it uh, and say, I'm not going to raise taxes. I came to govern. Politicians have two choices. They can either govern, meaning they make decisions about what's important, what's not, what's more important, what's less important. Otherwise, weak politicians, they don't govern. They just raise taxes to pay for every stupid idea they had for the last 200 years and add some new ideas they've got and just add taxes to it. Tax increases are what politicians do when they don't have the gumption to govern. And that's the distinction. I think that this commission and, and hopefully this Congress or a new Congress or an improved Congress could begin to govern rather than to raise taxes and spend. So you're going to help us, and we appreciate it. Absolutely, yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you, Grover. Now, excuse me. Now, this gentleman's testifying, I think, in lieu of uh, some other person. Well, I'm, uh, my name is Edwin. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, members yes. of the commission, my name is Edwin S. Jane. I'm the Associate Director of Legislation for the American Federation of State County Municipal Employees, and thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of AFSCME. I want to focus on three broad areas. First, uh, the pressing need to create jobs. Second, I want to offer our views on Social Security and Medicare. Third, I want to uh, discuss the need to address revenue creation. Uh, AFSCME feels strongly that job growth is essential to controlling federal deficits and must be our first priority. Also, the Commission should not make precipitous budget cuts that will shortchange vital government activity, making it more difficult to address long-term deficit concerns. Right now, in our opinion, the federal government is the only institution that has the capacity to stimulate economic activity and create jobs. Pursuing a deficit reduction strategy that relies on spending constraints will reduce demand just when we need to increase spending. Unfortunately, many who say they are concerned about deficits are focusing on immediate spending cuts as evidenced by the recent failure of the Congress to extend state aid and unemployment benefits. If this decision is not revisited, it will undercut the recovery as states and localities are forced to cut services, lay off more workers, and raise taxes, and it will undercut consumer demand. Uh, without an extension of the Recovery Act assistance, hundreds of thousands of additional jobs will be lost. State and local governments are already slashing spending on schools, roads, and other construction projects. Today we stand at an economic crossroads. If we fail to recognize the important role of government, we risk a long period of economic stagnation that will preclude investment in infrastructure and human capital that are necessary to f fuel a robust recovery and economy. Um, AFSCME is also deeply concerned about the present focus on reducing Social Security and Medicare as primary deficit reduction strategies, uh, especially proposals that would fundamentally change their character as universal insurance programs. Looking at the facts, Social Security does not add to the federal deficit. It has its own dedicated revenue source. The system is self-sustaining and doesn't rely on the government's general fund. Harmful cuts in Social Security must be rejected, including raising full retirement age, changes in the way benefits are calculated, and means testing. We also reject calls for privatization of Social Security program. Medicare also is not the problem. It is an efficient system with low administrative costs, and it makes little sense to look at Medicare and Medicaid for deficit reduction, especially before the new health care uh, law is given a chance to work. 
The final point I want to make is that new revenues must be included in any discussion of reducing the deficit. It would be wrong for the Commission to focus exclusively on the spending side. The consideration of revenues should focus on closing tax loopholes that enable large profitable corporations and the wealthiest Americans to avoid their fair share of taxes, and we should let the Bush era tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans that help drive up the deficit in the first place expire. In addition, financial institutions that help drive America's economy into crisis should also be looked at as a source of future revenues. Um, in conclusion, uh, I want to say that our nation's fiscal house does need to be put in better order. Uh, but job creation should be our number one goal at this time. Uh, Social Security and Medicare shouldn't be the scapegoats, and new revenues must also be on the table. Thank you very much. Thank you all. I appreciate it. We do appreciate it. I mean that, all of you. The uh, next uh, panel, please, uh, step forward and be comfortable and give your name and the organization, and uh, that will be helpful. What do you got there? No. Oh, come on. Harry Bird. What a, my, I served with, my father served with your grand and my father. Harry Bird. All right, you are. If I want to go and look back here. Please go forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Bowles, Senator Simpson, members of the Commission. My name is John Palatiello. I'm president of the Business Coalition for Fair Competition. We are a coalition of associations, businesses, think tanks, um, and organizations that are concerned about the degree to which the federal government actually competes with small business and private enterprise. And I'd like to focus my remarks on that problem and uh, how we can solve it uh, through this commission as a means of reducing the debt and deficit. We need a government that does those things that the American people expect their government to do for them. We should take care of constitutional responsibilities, take care of the most vulnerable in our society, but the government should not be doing things that the private market can do, and particularly those things that the private market can do better and cheaper. Today, we have a federal workforce of 1.9 million federal employees. That's non-postal and non-uniformed military. Of that 1.9 million workforce, over 850,000 federal employees are in occupations that are commercial in nature. This is as a result of an inventory conducted by the Clinton administration, the end of the Clinton administration. But today, we have a government that is too big to succeed. We need to right-size the government in order to eliminate unfair government competition with the private sector, make government work for the American people, and reduce our debt and deficit. Let me give some examples of some things that we can do to address this issue. One is end the government's duplication of and competition with the private sector in performance of commercially available activities. There was a policy put in place by Dwight Eisenhower in 1955 that said the government shall not compete, the government shall utilize the private sector to the maximum extent possible. That was implemented as a result of a recommendation of the Hoover Commission. But yet, despite that policy, we grew to a government of 850,000 federal employees doing things commercial in nature. So that policy should be reinstated and end the government's performance of commercial activities. Mr. Bowles, you'll remember that every White House conference on small business has identified this as the number one procurement-related issue for America's small businesses, and it's still that way today. There is legislation before Congress called the Freedom from Government Competition Act. Senator Simpson, you were a co-sponsor of that bill in your last term in the Senate. It ended up, um, it was sponsored by your colleague, our dear late friend, Craig Thomas. Uh, Senator Thomas's bill became the FAIR Act, the Federal Activities Inventory Reform Act. That's how we got the inventory of 850,000 federal employees. But most of those 850,000 positions have never been subjected to any kind of review as to whether the government performance is more efficient or private performance is more efficient, or whether the government indeed is duplicating and competing with the private sector. If you study those 850,000 uh, positions, 
you get $27 billion in savings right there. Whether it stays in-house or goes to contract, under A76, you get $27 billion in savings right there. So there are a number of strategies, direct conversion, privatization, vouchers, asset sales, divestitures, public-private partnerships. There's a number of tools that can be used. Uh, Mario Cuomo, not exactly a right-wing Republican, used to say that it is not government's obligation to provide services, but to see to it that they are provided. So we can rely more on the private sector. Um, Nonprofits, Senator Simpson, you took on the nonprofits and their tax status. Nonprofits do commercial activities. I know it's not politically easy, but we are losing a lot of revenue. <laughs> We're losing a lot of revenue by nonprofits that are performing commercial activities, and they ought to be taxed like everyone else. Uh, I agree with Mr. Norquist, the Bird Committee, the Joint Committee on the Reduction of Non Essential Federal Expenditures. We had to have one again in Congress. It was eliminated by the Budget Act in 74. That was a mistake. Um, and then uh, federal land. We don't have a current accurate inventory of the land the federal government owns. And we have a Byzantine process for surplus and disposal. BLM itself has identified over 3 million acres of land it has no useful need for. But they can't sell it. So we can generate revenue by putting that land uh, out for surplus get the revenue from the sale, and then it becomes productive to state and local government in generating revenues there as well. Uh, these are ideas that have been implemented by governors and mayors, Republican and Democrat across the country. They are sorely needed at the federal level. Thank you for the opportunity to share these ideas. Co-chairs, members, my name is Dave Walrath. I'm here representing the California Retired Teachers Association and the Retired Educators in California. While my state has been referenced today, uh, I will be talking about federal issues, not state issues. There are more than 200,000 retirees and beneficiaries of the California State Teachers Retirement System. The system was created initially in 1913 it was not blended with Social Security at that time. For the natural reason, there was no Social Security. In 1958, when teachers had the opportunity to vote whether they wanted to go into Social Security, they were paying more into their retirement system for a better disability benefit and survivor benefit than would have otherwise been provided. They chose to pay more to do more for their family in disability and survivor benefits. That action came back to haunt in the late 1980s when Social Security was amended to create a variety of changes, the windfall elimination provision and the government pension offset. The windfall elimination provision was intended to address double dipping, particularly within, private, uh, within public employment, but the effect has been it is creating difficulty in recruiting and retaining people from private sector employment into teaching, particularly in the areas of mathematics, science, technology, and the other types of areas we need to train students for the types of jobs that are in the future. The government pension offset is the second issue. Both have an effect. In California, we're a high cost state, a modest pension of one of our retirees, $1,500 a month, $2,000 a month, will effectively wipe out the spousal benefit, the death benefit, when their spouse dies. The spouse paid into Social Security with the theory that it was a social insurance policy to take care of their survivor. Government pension offset effectively for our members and educators in California can be eliminated even with a modest pension. We do not believe these were the intended outcomes when those provisions were proposed. We're here to talk about Social Security solvency. We have made recommendations and suggestions to congressional staff, both of Ways and Means Committee and Senate Finance, on alternatives for funding towards solvency. We believe that changing the employer cap is appropriate and increasing what is included within the payroll tax to include more compensation. Employers decide what compensation is, not employees. 
removing the cap and changing the cap, we would argue that you should also include other forms of compensation, such as stock options, other forms which should be counted toward the payroll tax for Social Security solvency. Also, the assumptions. Is the assumption on immigration an accurate assumption? I would argue that the immigration assumption has not been accurate for the last two decades, if not the last four decades, looking at the assumptions towards solvency. We hope that as you look towards solvency, you look at it not simply in monetary terms, but accept that solvency must also be balanced with equity and fairness in the benefits that are provided to ensure that it's not simply where you cut, where the committee does not fall into the trap of knowing the cost of everything and the value of nothing. Thank you. Chairman Simpson and Bowles and members of the Commission, I'm John Castellani and I'm President of Business Roundtable. We're an association of leading chief executive officers of U.S. companies and we have as our mission and our highest priority the sustained growth of the U.S. economy and job creation. The Business Roundtable believes that it is a fundamental necessity for the United States to address and correct structural federal budget deficits if we are to provide continued growth in the economy and economic security for the nation. It is indeed, as you have heard today and know very well, a complicated situation, and it is fur further complicated because it is done in a, an environment where we face a more globally competitive and intertwined economic environment than at any time in our past. Our policy solutions must take into consideration those interactions and the importance of creating an environment that is attractive to global investment and conducive to economic growth. In the very short time I have today, what I'd like to do is outline what we see as some of the factors that should be addressed. First, on the spending side, we believe we must find ways to control government spending by setting priorities through rigorous budgeting. As we look to the future, it's obvious that the growth in mandatory spending is the major driver of the significant increase in deficits. It is essential, we believe, that the growth of these programs be reduced to sustainable levels. While every government program was put in place for a reason, we must make the hard choices in today's environment on which programs need to be sustained, which programs should be cut back, folded into other operations, or eliminated. However, it is the mandatory programs that need to be under the closest examination. With respect to Social Security, everything should be put on the table for consideration that will make the program sustainable in the future while protecting those currently retired or nearing retirement. And even with the enactment of the recent health care legislation, we must continue to address the rising health care costs in our economy and our primary government health care programs of Medicare and Medicaid. Our ability to successfully manage both private and federal health care spending is critical to economic growth and the economic health of the nation. And we cannot solve this problem simply by shifting costs from the public sector to the private sector. On the revenue side, we must first undertake tax reform to develop a best tax structure for increasing economic growth. The existing tax structure, on the business side in particular, is a relic. It cannot be relied on for increased revenues without further eroding the ability of U.S. companies and the American workers to compete in a global economy. We need a tax structure that is conducive to economic growth, which will help increase revenues. Since only 5% of the world's consumers live in the United States, we believe we need a tax structure that allows U.S. companies to compete to win business in the other 95% of the world. Our ability to successfully compete in world markets provides good jobs for American workers and builds a stronger domestic economy. In addition, by in addition to providing the right tax structure, obviously the overall level of taxation must be determined with a full understanding of its impact on growth and capital formation. Our trading partners have largely adopted tax systems geared to attracting investment of both foreign and locally based companies and for serving as hospital lo hospitable locations for a global corporation to be headquartered and they continue every day to aim to be more competitive and provide a more competitive business environment as we have seen recently in the United Kingdom and in Japan. The U.S. tax system is totally out of sync with the rest of the world. Our tax structure and tax levels will directly determine whether we as a nation will be able to retain and attract 
investment in high paying jobs. So we need a tax system that is competitive with the rest of the world. In conclusion, we'd summarize in three overly simple points for this very complex problem. First, we believe that all spending should be on the table with particular attention to growth and mandatory spending. Second, we, need there's, we believe there's a critical need to revamp our Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid systems. And third, a comprehensive reform of our tax system is needed to establish a tax structure that will allow U.S. corporations to compete globally and a level of taxation that will enhance capital formation. Thank you. Uh, John, sorry to put you on the spot sorry. on this one, but just building on your comment on a, a more effective tax structure, do you have some thoughts in mind on what that is? Yeah. Um, as you know well, what we're, where we're competing in the U, uh, around the world, we're competing with the U.S. structure um, that is out of sync with most of the rest of the world. All but four nations in the OECD have converted to a territorial system. Um, and there are lots of different iterations of a territorial system, but it is a system that uh, only taxes income once, as opposed to the very cumbersome system we have now in a foreign tax system, which not only drives us to tax uh, income more than once, probably twice, um, but it also puts us in a head-to-head -head disadvantage. So irrespective of the tax rate, U.S. companies competing with companies with a territorial-like system pay an increment more in cost than their foreign competitor. So it is both the level of taxation and the structure that we're concerned about. Uh, one more follow-up, just to make it more complicated. One of the proposals, and uh, as Senator Simpson mentioned earlier, uh, Paul Ryan. Yes. If I were to take a look at Paul Ryan's plan, one of the things he talks about is a much lower rate but replaced with a VAT tax, which he thinks would make us more competitive worldwide. Could you just give us a perspective on what you think of that? Yes. The, the, um, a, as you know, the mix of taxes in a lot of our foreign competitors, uh, uh, nations, is, is uh, very different. They have a lower reliance as a percentage on income-based tax and a higher reliance on value-added taxes or consumption-based taxes. Consumption-based taxes have disproportionate impacts, as you know, across the economy. They hurt some uh, uh, and, and help other forms of activity, as well as issues about regressivity. But one thing that they do do, the way that they're structured in our foreign, foreign competitors, is that they, do, they are rebated at the border and therefore give company, countries, companies in countries with that form of tax a greater uh, economic advantage than U.S. companies currently enjoy. Uh, you know, the, we, we certainly think, like everything, it is uh, something that should be examined, but examined in the context of does the overall structure of our tax system promote our competitiveness, promote job creation, as well as the level of taxation? Does it promote capital formation? John, does the, does the BRT have a tax plan that it would endorse now? Um, we don't uh, yet. We are working on uh, some various iterations of it, but it, it, um, the primary uh, nature of it would be a territorial-like system for dealing with multinational corporations, and then a, um, uh, a, a simpler system that in, um, expedites um, uh, capital formation uh, within the domestic economy. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairman Bowles and committee. Uh, my name is Stephen Meltzer. Uh, you may address me as G4 if you wish. Um, I am here to represent Yavapai Regional Capital, which is an infrastructure merchant bank based in the mountain states. We are a team of uh, international and domestic bankers with many years of experience together um, advocating public-private partnerships. And I'd like to tell you a bit why. Uh, we see that rebuilding our infrastructure is a unique and potentially transformational economic stimulus opportunity. Our firm believes that creating private sector employment and profitable tax base growth by rebuilding infrastructure is the only way to reverse our fiscal spiral. 
We recommend that government vastly enhance its impact by encouraging and incentivizing public-private partnerships, P3s, along with a properly structured NIB. P3s can serve as a private sector stimulus package for infrastructure, one that will not run out of money before the job is done, will not increase taxes, and can deliver jobs and economic development on an enormous scale. That's how government can launch this epic undertaking without new public debt. We've made this point in several conversations with PREB, by the way. The problem, we all know, our infrastructure has traditionally been financed by municipal bonds, but that public finance well is running dry. Governments are tapped and new taxes are a free ride out of office. The solution, we believe, leverage public financing with private sector capital that is looking for solid, non-exotic cash flow investments, i.e. infrastructure. A problem, U.S. banks abandoned P3s and project finance lending in the late 1980s. Overseas banks and economies, however, remained in the game to the tune of nearly $2 trillion of funding, which helped drive decades of growth in Europe, Asia, and South America. Our firm's principles were instrumental in many of those transactions, by the way. Solution is to structure the NIB, National Infrastructure Bank, to support private sector leveraged commercial only activities free of political motivation and to incentivize U.S. banks to go into that space. Problems, P3s deliver long term. U.S. lenders have been short term and real estate oriented. And the failure of a few poorly structured P3s here have led some to conclude they don't work. As for the successful overseas model, some in government think if it's good for foreigners, it's not good enough for us and P3s just cannot compete with traditional financing. Solution, educate and incentivize U.S. bankers, legislators, and voters. Evidence abounds that private and public financing costs after tax are essentially equal, and that P3s are better managed, that's the private sector's strength, so they finish sooner and cost less. U.S. power industry achieved 40% cost savings with private capital some time back, the U.S. Conference of Mayors Water Council in 2010 cites similar savings. Savings in project costs plus equal financing costs mean lower user charges. Voters love that. It's the ideal outcome. Our recommendations. PREB is studying the European Investment Bank as a model for the NIB. That model is highly politicized. The board should study instead the Export Credit Agency's co-financing model, which is highly commercial because no government wants to subsidize another with politically motivated financing. Asking U.S. infrastructures to, uh, companies to compete without project capital from our banks is like asking Silicon Valley to compete without venture capital. Unleash that capital. With infrastructure, P3s re-involve U.S. banks in a stable asset class based on cash flow, not property appreciation. Create a Washington-based infrastructure-wide debt rediscounting or TIFIA style lending capability, working with experienced P3 practitioners on the ground, among whom we recommend ourselves. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And uh, the next panel, please, if you come forward, uh, get comfortable and give your name and the name of your organization. We'll proceed.